Welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. This is a podcast where we bring successful tech sales professionals, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs to share best practices, insights, and lessons learned with other tech sales professionals. As a sales professional, the more we learn, the more we earn. Once we earn it, how can we put those hard earned commission dollars back to work to build additional income streams that will create the freedom we are all working to achieve? I'm your host, Chris Freeman. I'm a high tech sales leader, real estate investor, and lifetime learner. All right, welcome, high tech freedom listeners. I am your host, Chris Freeman. And for our next episode, I'm really excited to have Cynthia Barnes join me. So, Cynthia is a champion for women in sales. She is an award winning sales influencer, a keynote speaker, a LinkedIn top voice, which is a rating that you can get, and the founder and CEO of National Association of Women Sales Professionals and the Barnes Sales Institute. So, I'm really excited to have on the podcast today. Cynthia, welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. How are we today? Love the energy. Well, hey, um, so Cynthia, you are, uh, you're currently in a role where you're helping female sales professionals. Um, I did a little bit of an introduction there, but please share a little bit more about your journey to this point. Well, I, I've always been a woman in sales, um, selling everything from logistics. I was a freight broker to high-end skincare. Um, I was a recruiter, and there wasn't anything that I didn't want to sell. And in 2016, I said, you know, I've been at the top 1% for years. What's next? I could go into another vertical. I could go into intangible sales or tangible sales. And I said, what do I do? And I was really at a tipping point in my career. So I went on Facebook, you know, the ultimate philosopher with their memes. And one, and I'm going to paraphrase this and butcher this, but it said essentially the true measure of whether or not you are a success in life isn't based upon how well you do. It's based upon how many others you help do well. So I thought, Eureka, Instead of Cynthia Barnes getting to the top 1%, what if I taught other women how to get to the top 1%? So that's how the mission started. Mm, I love it. And, you know, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on the podcast today is, so my podcast audience is really high-tech sales professionals for the most part, and maybe some other salespeople that just want to learn because all of these skills are translatable. Um, but it is a male dominated audience for sure. Sure. And, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years and, you know, typical team calls, it's you know, 10 men, one woman. Um, it's just sort of the way it is. And so I do really believe that, you know, you, you, we're starting to see more female uh, people join um, the industry and join the ranks. And it does add a whole nother layer and dynamic, but still, it's still a very male dominated business. So I'm just excited to hear some of your insights and, um, Kind of where where you're taking that side of uh, you know the sales experience, absolutely. Um, so let let me ask you. So Cynthia, what is when you're coaching your female students and clients? You know what are what are some of the initial things that you're really focusing on to help them level up their game? It's really important, and the women I coach are. Let me let me first say that they are warriors. They are champions. They they sign up to sell in a male-dominated industry and they say, you know what? I realize that the playing field may not be level. I don't care. I'm going to soar anyway. So the first thing we want to enforce is nobody's a victim. Nobody is going to let those circumstances cause you to say, woe is me or why is me? Why me? We're going to adopt that GI Jane or that Katniss from the Hunger Games type of mentality and say, okay, come on challenges. How do I overcome them and let me conquer them? So that's the first thing is to instill and reinforce that mentality that You know, there are three types of people in the world, those who make things happen, those who wait for things to happen, and those who wonder what the hell happened. We, if we are going to be successful, realize that we are the first type. We are the type that make things happen. Yeah. And I love the visual. So, you know, why why do we need more women in sales? Why do we need more more women in high-tech sales? Bottom line, it's about the dollar. Because diverse teams earn up to 19% more revenue year over year. 
Why is that? Why is that? Because your your customer base is largely female as well. Women sell equally as well to men as they do women. Women have mindsets and traits and and characteristics that men don't because we're simple. It's quite simply we're different. So when women sell, we hone in on empathy, relationship building, and we're great time managers. So if you want a diverse sales team, the main thing you want to focus on is, well, my customer base is diverse. Why shouldn't my sales team be as diverse? Why shouldn't it be a reflection? The second thing is your customer base is looking at your sales team to see whether or not they are represented in your sales team. Mm -hmm. It it just makes good sense dollar wise. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, what about the... um the interest out there. Cause you know, I've been, I've been a hiring manager for many, many years. And when I'm out looking for new candidates, I'm not necessarily seeing the woman candidate out there um, putting her hat in the ring. It depends on where you look. For example, when companies like Google and Oracle um, and Adobe come to NAWSP and they say, well, we can't find female sales candidates. I say, where are you looking? And they say, well, we're looking on LinkedIn and Indeed and ZipRecruiter. And I say, if you're looking for a trucker, you go to trucker.com. If you're looking for diverse female sales candidates who sell B2B services, then come to NAWSP. So well, on the one hand, I can understand the challenge of we don't see where they are. Once you know where they are, then look and engage with them where they are. Meet them where they are. Yeah. Well, that's no different than selling, right? I mean, it's exactly it's, you got to go hunt where the where the game is at, right? Yes. Yes. So, so um, Cynthia, would you mind just expanding a little bit more on what is an AWSP? Yes. National Association of Women Sales Professionals is a member-based organization of 15,000 women who sell B2B services in predominantly male-dominated industries like commercial real estate, SaaS, technology, cloud sales, um, outsourced services, logistics. If it's, if it's um, a male-dominated industry or if it's B2B, you can pretty much guess that our members are there. Wow, what a what an incredible service. So how does somebody um, sign up or join? They can join us at NAWSP.org. We specialize in providing our members with sales-based training, um, professional development created by women in sales, for women in sales. It's designed to amplify the unique strengths that women possess while helping them overcome the unique challenges that they face. Yeah. We provide them with community resources, access to companies who are laser focused on elevating women in sales. That's fascinating. So is it uh, so once you're in the program, is, are there monthly calls or is it just as needed? How does uh, the engagement work? We have our own app and we also have weekly live coaching calls that women can join for live coaching on a variety of topics, everything from LinkedIn prospecting to mastering the discovery call. And all of those calls are recorded. So we have a large database of pre-recorded calls that um, they can go in and look at at their leisure. Wow, I want to join. Come on. <laughs> That's like a great program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Cynthia, you, uh, you talk about the, you talked earlier during your introduction about the, uh, you'd been at that top 1%. What does it take uh, to be in the top 1% as a sales professional? Number one, it takes the decision to say, I want to be in the top 1%. And it's simple as writing down on a sheet of paper, what can I do to reach the top 1%? Because the top 1% can be overwhelming if you think about it. But if you take that sheet of paper and you write down at the top of it, what can I do to reach the top 1%, then list 25 things that you can do and you attack each one individually, become an expert in each one, you'll get there. They say the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? Mm. Yeah. The second thing you want to do is adopt the mindset of the top 1%. So back in the day when I was early in my sales career, they said, take the income that you want to earn and divide that by the number of hours that you work in a year, which is normally 2080. Then you will find your hourly rate. If you want to make, for example, $100,000 a year 
and you divide that by 2080, that's around $137 an hour, 13750 if my math is correct. Refuse to do anything in your life that is not worth $137.50. That means when it comes time to buy groceries or go shopping for groceries, outsource it to Instacart or Shipped. Because if you can work on your book of business at your hourly rate of $137.50, then you can outsource that grocery shopping to someone else for $9.99 a month. And you can work on your book of business and proceed to generate or those money generating activities, cleaning your house, washing your car, doing your laundry. Your time is worth more than what you can outsource those services to be, right? Oh, it's yeah, so true. And it's, um, you know, I've as a sales leader and even as a rep for many years, right? I, one, of the, one of the things that I've learned over time is that it's not hard to be busy in sales. Oh, yeah. But are you busy doing the right things? You know, right. at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I was so busy. But was I doing revenue generating activities? And if you weren't, reevaluate. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. So I have an earlier episode. Uh, go check it out if you're listening to this episode about goal setting and then more importantly about how to achieve those goals. And so I go through a process of picking out my big three tasks for the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's all kinds of things I need to do, but if I can just get these three things done, it was a productive day. And one of my objectives when doing that is at least one of those has to be revenue generating. Oh, yes. And if it's not, then I've got the wrong things that I'm focusing on. So, right. yeah, that's great insight. I love it. Well, so what, what holds back top performer or what holds somebody back from being a top performer? I would say the number one thing I see in top performers versus others is their decision to be a student of sales. And quite simply, if you were on death row for committing a crime, would you go to an attorney or a lawyer who didn't stay up to date or abreast of the latest legal news and happenings? If you were faced with an illness, a life-threatening illness, would you go to a doctor who didn't read the American Journal of Medicine? Would you go to a doctor who didn't stay up to date with, with continuing education seminars and, and constant education? No. So if we want to be treated as professional sales people, why are we not studying sales like a profession? Mm, I love it. Yeah, totally true. You've got to read an hour a day. I don't care if that's on Audible, on a Kindle, or on a physical book. If you want to be a student of sales, you read every single day. You turn your drive time into university on wheels. You listen to podcasts. You listen to audiobooks. You don't listen to the radio. That, that one thing right there separates top performers from the land of mediocrity. Yeah, so true. And I think that people that are listening to this podcast probably already kind of get that, right? Because they're listening. But I mean, then I've had these conversations um, with people that I've worked with for years. And um, I have one a VP, he, he, I'm sure he's listening and he knows who he is, but he always talks about you need to be a student of the game. Yes. And, you know, if you're performing well in sales, you're making great income, you can be making as much, probably more income than a doctor or a lawyer, yet many salespeople don't put in that same level of effort around their education on an annual basis. You know, if you look at a doctor, they're always having to re-educate themselves, always. read journals, get recertified. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We should be doing the same thing. And the beauty is we don't have to go through the same level of schooling that they did to get there. Right, um, right. Yeah. Right. And also don't forget that every 90 days, you need some type of formal conference, whether it's virtual or whether it's in person, because at the 90 day mark, after being beat down every single day with rejection after rejection after rejection, you need that influx of motivation. So every 90 days, you've got to take in some type of conference. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Like a, a sales conference or sales conference um, retreat? 
something where you surround yourself with people who are on your similar journey, where they can infuse you with that motivation. Because quite honestly, sales is the, the, one of the hardest jobs out there. We get rejected 90% of the time and we wake up the next morning to do it again. After a while, it beats you down. So at the 90 day mark, you need to be around people who can empathize, who can say, you know what, get back up. It's not how you fall down. It's how you get back up and let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, that's one, one thing that I, I've always experienced when I go to the big global sales conference at the end of the year, right? You go to that, you, you spend a week or four days and you go through all the presentations and you leave and you're all excited and you're all motivated. So I guess it's taking that and doing it on a quarterly basis. Yes. And it doesn't have to be with your company. I, I often no. go to real estate conferences and I leave and, you know, half the conference is not about real estate. It's about, you know, mindset and, you know, being an entrepreneur and I leave excited and yes. that, that sort of um, bleeds into everything I do. It does. It does. Yes. And imagine if you were to do that every quarter. Oh, that's fascinating. Interesting. Well, so Cynthia, all right. So I like to, I've been asking guests recently, if there was just one single thing a sales rep could do or start doing that would have a, a dramatic impact on their business, what would that one thing be right now? The first one is stop comparing yourself to the top of the leaderboard. And the reason we do that is because people say, well, the top of the leaderboard is the creme de la creme. However, when you compare yourself to the person at the top of the leaderboard, you're only getting marginally better than what they were able to accomplish. What if you set your goal at what you can accomplish? You would blow the leaderboard out of the water. You can set the gold standard rather than trying to compete or compare yourself with someone else's definition of the gold standard, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing would be, instead of looking at your annual revenue goal or your quarterly revenue goal, reverse engineer it to the tiniest little component. I often coach women in sale and they say, well, th my annual goal is $1.5 million. Okay, well, that can seem kind of daunting. How many calls does it take on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve that? So you take your goal and you break it down into bite-sized manageable chunks. If I know that I have to set five appointments a day because three will reschedule, one will cancel, and one will hold, and know my numbers, I can manage five appointments a day. If I do my five appointments a day, I don't have to worry about the 1.5. I can worry about the five appointments a day. How many calls does it take to get five appointments a day? How many emails? How many of this? How many of that? Know your numbers. I should be able to call you at three o'clock in the morning and say, Chris, what are your numbers? And you would say five appointments a day, 20 phone calls, three outlets. LinkedIn outreaches, whatever, know your numbers. I love it. Well, and also what you're saying there is focus on what you can control. Yes. You can't control 1.5 million. Nope. That was just arbitrarily given to you, but you can control the activities that'll produce it. So focus on that. That's the only thing you can control. You can control the controllables. Everything else will fall into place. So as we get uh, near the end, um, I, I notice that you have a pretty healthy and active social media presence. Uh, from a sales perspective, you know, can you share one or two tips that salespeople should be considering when really leveraging social media as one of their sales tools? Social media is crucial to my success. The reason being is people buy from people they know, like, and trust. We've all heard that. Mary Kay always said, instead of going out and attacking people, chasing people, why not position yourself to attract them? And let me give you a quick story. In Africa, the Europeans and Americans go on safari. And what they do is they break you up into the desert, into quadrants, the Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and Northwest quadrant. Your tour guide, most likely from Africa, it gets in a Jeep and he's got a walkie talkie. And the groups will go out to their respective quadrants. And then someone around 7 a.m. will say, hey, we've got a herb, herd of zebra out in the southwest quadrant. So everyone from the other three quadrants will ha hustle themselves down to the southwest quadrant to see these zebra. And by the time they get there, the zebra are gone. 
They go back to their respective quadrants. Then an hour and a half later, someone from the Northeast quadrant says, we've got a herd of buffalo up here. So everybody hightails it up to the Northeast quadrant and the herd of buffalo are gone. This happens all day long. I don't understand it, but apparently it is something to do. That evening, as the sun starts to set, everyone goes back to base camp. The sun is setting. You have a nice seven course meal in an area that is surrounded by an electric fence. And out of the corner of your eye, as the, as dusk sal- settles, you notice movement and you elbow your tour guide and you say, what is that over there? And he says, oh, that's a pack of zebra. And you say, well, what are they doing? And he said, they're drinking at the watering hole. Fifteen minutes later, you elbow your tour guide again and you say, what's that? And they say, it's a herd of buffalo. It dawns on you that you could have stayed yourself in your hut with an Oprah magazine reading all day because all of the animals are now visible. The moral of the story is, and and let me back up a little bit. You ask the tour guide, well, why is, why are all the animals coming there? And he says, this is the only watering hole for miles. They have no choice but to come. Mm -hmm. The moral of the story is you should be something or someone so valuable that your prospects and customers have to come to you. Be the water. So as you position yourself on social media, position yourself as that obvious choice. Give so much value, it hurts. Answer those questions that your target market is asking. So they say, you know what? I'm going to tune into what Chris has to say because he is answering the questions that I'm already asking. So when they do have a question about how to do something, they come to you. Be the water. Hmm. Interesting. Well, if you're if you're working for a large, let's say, large technology company, maybe you're not you're the salesperson. Maybe you're not the engineer. You're not as technical. Um, how do you create that value for your clients in your in that market? That's an excellent question. Yeah, that's an excellent question because your marketing department's already coming out with stuff you should post. No, right. <laughs> that, that is not what you should do. I would t- make a list of the top 30 questions that my customers ask me. And I would get together with my team and say, what questions do you hear on a regular basis? And it could be, what is XYZ? And XYZ could be what your product or service is. What does XYZ do? Could I be better at X, Y, Z? What resources are available to help me with X, Y, Z? Who else is using X, Y, Z? Those questions that your target market is asking, you answer those in your LinkedIn posts. Mm. That's how you become that subject matter expert or that thought leader. And you blow your competition out of the water because most likely they are just forwarding whatever your marketing department's putting out. Right. So you're not asking for anything. You're not promoting anything. You're giving no specific answer to a question that they haven't asked you directly, but it might be on their mind. Yes. And you know that it's on your mind because they are asking. It's what you've heard before. So one third of your posts should be educational or informative. Another third of your posts should be inspirational because you know what? There's a lot of crap out in the world. So give me something to make me smile. Mm -hmm. And then a third of your posts should be promotional. And if you do that every single day, you don't have to worry about the LinkedIn algorithm that changes with the wind. If you're posting every single day, everything else, it falls into place. If you post every single day and I post every single day and we each get a thousand views per post. If you post every single week, once a week, you'll get 52,000 posts or 52,000 views. If I post every single day, I will get 365,000 views. The algorithm doesn't matter. It's the numbers. Right. Right. Interesting. Well, my uh, my social media partner for my uh, real estate stuff, I'm sure she's smiling because we've had this specific conversation, exactly what you just talked about, the third, the third, the third. Now, I'm not posting every day, but when we do the post, it's one inspirational. I do a, I'm doing these, uh, I've been trying to do a text a day to my kids about something inspirational. And so I translated that into one post a week on LinkedIn and some of the social media and just, you know, kind of doing that to get that out there. But also, um, I don't necessarily have 52 
great quotes on top of my head. So other people have provided their inspirational quotes in the comments. And so I've been crowdsourcing some of that, but uh, sure. Yeah. That's great feedback. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm going to talk to you offline some more about that. Okay, sure. Well, hey, as we wrap up, Cynthia, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience about uh, sales or what you're doing with your business? There's tons going on in women in sales, tons, tons, tons. I've got a new book coming out called The Cure, How Diversity and Equity Will Fix Your Sales Culture and Boost Profits. It's available on Amazon. I have another book, How to Reach the Top 1%, um, A Strategic Game Plan for Warrior Women in Sales. If you are a sales leader and you'd like to know how to coach women in sales, how to attract, hire, develop, and retain them, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am happy to have a conversation around best practices, what other companies are doing. And lastly, stop dreaming so small. A lot of people say, you know what? I want to make $250,000 this year. How about you, as Grant Cardone says, 10X that? Yeah. Yeah. They print new money every day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's funny. I was I was just thinking about that this morning, you know, 10X. Yeah. Don't put limits on yourself that do not exist. Go for it and stop dreaming so small. Woo. Yeah. So I worked with, it's funny you say that because I worked with a VP and uh, we were out in Florida doing a QBR after uh, an annual sales conference. And he said, you know, why do you have to set a target, you know, as you're planning your year, we're doing our quarterly business reviews, but really for the year, it's like, why do you have to set a target that's relative to the quota we gave you? In a way, I wish we hadn't given you a quota because now you're not aiming high enough. Right. You know, you, you had that 1.5 quota. It's like, yeah, hey, you know, I'll go for 1.5, maybe two. Why not 10? Exactly. You know, why are you limiting yourself? So it's yes. such a great point. Yes. Along those same lines, though, sometimes sales managers have to be sensitive to the fact if someone's not meeting quota, if you go to them and say, you know what, Charlie, I think that you are capable of so much more. If he's not meeting quota, he's most likely as on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he is struggling emotionally or mentally to meet his basic needs mm -hmm. of rent, mortgage, car payment, food, things like that. He cannot consciously conceive of I should be making $250,000 and I could be. He's concentrating on how am I going to rob Peter to pay Paul to pay my mortgage. So be sensitive to that. Meet him where he is and simply ask him, Charlie, how can I help you get to this level? What can I do to help you? What do you need? And Charlie could come back with, you know what? I don't know, but I'm struggling. Sometimes as managers, we want to be so motivational and inspirational. Instead, maybe we should be more empathetic and say, you know what, Charlie, I see that you're having trouble. What do you need? Charlie could come back and say, you know what? My wife's got cancer. My kids have autism. I've got a whole host of things. Everyone is struggling and we don't even know about it. So let's, let's employ a little more empathy. Yeah. There's this whole thing called life going on out there. So Whew. yeah. Well, Cynthia, I will. Um, so for the listeners, um, if they would like to reach out or get in touch with you, how can they reach out? LinkedIn. That's my jam. So please reach out on LinkedIn. Let's have a conversation. Um, you can follow me. You can connect with me. You'll need my email address, which is Cynthia at N-A-W-S-P, National Association of Women Sales Professionals dot O-R-G. And let's connect and have a conversation. I'm always looking for new friends. Sounds good. And we'll put that link in the show notes as well as the link to your um, uh, now in-person events that you're starting to ramp up. So go check those out if they're going to be in a town near you. Yes, please. Love to love to connect and bump elbows. Cynthia, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to connecting with everyone. If you could, listeners, reach out to Chris and let him know the one thing that stood out from today's podcast so that um, and, and start a conversation with him. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for joining us today. To get more sales and real estate tips, you can subscribe to our newsletter at hightechfreedom.com. You can also join our private Facebook and LinkedIn group that is exclusively for sales professionals. If you found a nugget of good information in the podcast, please subscribe, give us a positive rating and write a review. If there is a topic that you would like us to cover in the future, please send us a note through our website at hightechfreedom.com. 
Until next week, make this your best week ever. Bye.